Good afternoon and thanks for joining us for today's Expedition 32 post spacewalk briefing. With us today we have Mike Sefredini, the International Space Station Program Manager, Ed Van Seis, the Flight Director who is in charge of the EVA today, and Keith Johnson who is the lead EVA officer for this spacewalk. We'll start off with some statements with our participants and then we'll go to questions. Mike? Well, uh, good afternoon. Uh, we're spending a few moments with you today talking about our EVA. Uh, it was EVA 18 that we had uh, conducted today with the primary purpose uh, to replace a main bus switching unit on board ISS that, uh, that was supplying power to the ISS but couldn't be commanded. Uh, as you recall, uh, some months ago we uh, uncovered this problem and have been uh, living with it uh, ever since. Um, again, it was a relatively nominal configuration for us. Uh, but we were unable to command it, uh, and there are very few situations where we need to do that on a regular basis. And so we were able to wait uh, until now to conduct the EVA when we were ready and, and had everything in place. Uh, the team did a great job today. Uh, this EVA, uh, one of the longest in the history, in our history, and uh, the longest uh, EVA, uh, uh, um, excuse me, increment EVA uh, that we've conducted uh, since the ISS program began. Unfortunately, today though we didn't con we didn't complete all of our tasks. Uh, we did uh, we had we had three main tasks that we had planned, and then one get ahead that was very important to us. Uh, the MBSU, of course, was the primary uh, job for the uh, for the EVA team, but we also had some cables that had to be routed so we could uh, supply power uh, to a new Russian module that's coming up in a year or so. Uh, in addition to that, we had a boom camera on the SSRMS that had failed that we had to replace. And then if we had time, we wanted to put a uh, cover on the uh, docking port that the shuttle used to use uh, to keep it clear of debris until, uh, until we put the new uh, docking system, attached the new docking system uh, some years from now. Uh, and as I said, uh, uh, we didn't get all those tasks completed. We did get the cables routed. Uh, unfortunately, in the process of trying to uh, reinstall uh, the, new, the spare MBSU, we had some trouble um, getting the bolts torqued down, uh, and, the, and Ed and Keith will talk more about that after this. Um, but they did a, did a, uh, a tremendous job, uh, Ed and his team, the, the engineers and the crew, a fantastic job of, of working with, with the, uh, the box and uh, taking as many steps as they could, could come up with. Uh, to try to get this thing reinstalled and ultimately we were not successful. Uh, so in the end we left the MBSU uh, in place. It's partially torqued down but uh, the, power, uh, the power connections are not made so we are getting no power from that particular MBSU and then we, we've tied it down and in this position we're in a stable configuration. The box is fine. Thermally it'll be okay uh, and we'll, uh, we'll decide what to do next and, uh, and uh, go take care of it here in the, in the fu near future. Uh, in the meantime, the ISS is being supplied power from six of its eight arrays. Uh, the team installed some jumpers prior to uh, powering down the MBSU uh, in preparation for the, for the EVA, and those jumpers allowed us to get all power to all the ISS systems and payloads. And, uh, and so really the, what the team has to do, they have access, we can get power to all the systems, uh, but we only have uh, three quarters of the power available that we normally have from the ISS. And so uh, depending on the task at hand over the next several days, the team may have to manage power loads a little bit, uh, but uh, this is familiar territory for the team and so we'll be able to, to deal with that while we uh, decide what our next, uh, next plan is. We do have uh, a number of, uh, of uh, flights uh, taking place here in the next few days. We have an HTV that's going to depart uh, on the 6th. Uh, we have uh, the crew uh, coming home on the uh, 16th of September local time. Um, and, uh, and then we have an ATV uh, departure on the 25th of September. And so uh, while we think about our plan and when we might do another EVA, if we decide that's necessary, we'll have to take all that into account, uh, move things around in order to accommodate that. Uh, but uh, if we do decide to do an EVA, I think you'll see us, uh, if we can, can determine what, uh, what we can do to get the uh, MBSU ultimately installed, you'll, you'll hear us talking about perhaps trying to do that sooner rather than later uh, in, the, in the program. Uh, so uh, for, for the team first, the, the fantastic job. They did a great job. The vehicle is in a, in a good configuration. Uh, we know how to operate uh, with, without power from, uh, from two of the eight arrays. 
Uh, but we do have power to all the critical systems. And so, uh, as always, the team will sort this out, uh, decide the appropriate plan of action, and uh, we'll go out and take care of this in, uh, in uh, due time. Uh, and with that, I'll hand you over to Ed, who will uh, talk to you more about the, EV, the specifics of the EVA. Well, thank you, Mr. Suffordini. And uh, I, I need to really start off uh, by reiterating uh, the, the thanks and uh, excellence that our team uh, across the board showed today. Um, we train frequently, uh, not only in mission operations, but uh, in all of our different areas on handling uh, malfunctions as they come up. And uh, as even though we didn't necessarily train for this particular situation, it's the mentality that we uh, have grown up with and that we uh, demonstrate on console that gave us all the tools we needed to first try to troubleshoot uh, the bolt issues that we saw. And uh, obviously we tried everything that we could come up with uh, jointly within the ops team and also with all the engineering uh, community working to try to resolve the issue. Uh, but was also, as was also mentioned, uh, we have an ops team that is uh, well equipped to handle uh, long-term off-nominal situations if it has to. Uh, if we don't have all uh, eight power channels, we know how to work with those resources. And uh, as was mentioned, we're really not in a posture that the redundancy is compromised on board the vehicle, but just a matter of which facilities and which operations we want to do at a given time uh, with the amount of power that we have available. So while it's not ideal that the situation that we're in right now, it's certainly not one that uh, leaves us um, in, in a off situation that we can't keep moving forward. Um, as far as the EVA itself, we got the crew up uh, right on time. They went through their EVA preparations uh, without any issues. We got out the door uh, also right on time at 7.15 local and um, didn't work any suit issues throughout the day. And uh, we were also uh, successful in getting the, the cables routed, and that was one that we also needed to track pretty closely. Uh, obviously, we ran into issues with the, uh, the bolts themselves on the MBSU. And that took uh, most of our attention throughout the, uh, the rest of the EVA. We did get the failed box, though, um, installed on its um, stowage platform behind the airlock and got that covered back up with its thermal blankets so we have that uh, piece of hardware fully secured, which only leaves us with one problem to go finish resolving, and that's the, uh, the box that's sitting out on the S0 truss, uh, not fully installed yet. But uh, the team did a great job at the end as well. An EVA, obviously, this long uh, not only takes its toll on the, on the crew and having to uh, work uh, the length of the day that they had to, but also the, uh, the integrated team. And uh, I never saw anything that would give me any indications that uh, I had to worry about their capabilities or fatigue. Um, they did an exceptional job. We got the crew back inside safely. We absolutely know our configuration that we're in, and the teams are already talking about uh, how we might go uh, resolve the issue and uh, get things squared away on board to support all the operations that uh, Mr. Suffordini mentioned and get us back to uh, operating the world-class laboratory that we have on orbit. Um, as far as operations go, uh, that was uh, pretty much the highlights of our day. And Keith, I don't know if you have anything else to add about the uh, bolt failures that we saw. Thank you, Mr. Van Seis. Um Let's see. So uh, first of all, we are fortunate that the crew uh, used the in-suit light exercise pre-brief protocol this morning. They, uh, they got out the door, as Ed mentioned, in a, in a timely fashion, and also we were able to change out um, their uh, contamination control cartridge, which uh, provides them the CO2 scrubbing capability, and we installed uh, new ones with 40 minutes of pre breathe left, um, and that allowed us to have the extension time available to do the troubleshooting that, that Ed mentioned. Um, during the EVA, uh, we did have one suit issue that uh, we began tracking towards the end of the EVA uh, where Aki's temperature started rising. Um, it, uh, it stayed within limits and, and he got the cooling he needed, but uh, we'll have to look at that suit uh, afterwards to determine if it's go for EVA again. Um, during the EVA, the, the bolt issue that uh, we've been talking about, I brought some hardware along with me um, off to my side over here. Uh, this is um, what we call a stanchion bolt. Uh, the H2 bolt, um, and the bolt that drives into it over here is on the MBSU itself. And this bolt here drives uh, the, the box down into the configuration that it needs to go in. Um, on our first attempt, we drove the bolt uh, quite a few turns, um, but not the sufficient number uh, to get it all the way seated and the electrical connectors made it. And as part of our troubleshooting, we backed the box back out again um, and tried to inspect it. And during the inspection, we noted that 
there was some fragments inside of uh, the, the, uh, the housing itself, and uh, we decided that it probably was prudent to clean uh, the work site out. So we went back to the airlock and retrieved a pair of pliers. Um, that's, we went back for a different socket and found that it wasn't in the airlock as we expected. And we're going to have to do a, a, a team to go look and find out where that uh, particular socket is. Uh, we did find a pair of pliers. We brought it with us to the work site and uh, used that to, to dab around. And we found that some material came out of uh, the socket um, when, when we did that test. And we tried to drive the bolt again with no success, fewer turns this time. Uh, when we backed it out, we retrieved what's called a connector cleaner tool, and I have a picture of that. Uh, this is a, a gas canister that holds nitrogen. Uh, I don't have the exact pressure that it's in there, but it gives us about uh, 10 seconds worth of a, a burst of gas. Um, Sonny Williams injected that down into the uh, receptacle on the socket and uh, depressed the, the uh, handle, and it... Um, sprayed nitrogen gas down. She noted that uh, more material came out of it at that point. Uh, we then decided that it probably was prudent to spray uh, the bolt on the MBSU itself. And again, when we did that, oh, I'm at the wrong end there. That's the bolt down at this end. Uh, when, we, uh, when we sprayed, more material came out. Uh, back at this end, this is... Um, the, the bolt that the crew members drive, we attached what's called a torque multiplier on this particular interface, and that increases uh, the torque that goes into the bolt that the pistol grip tool can supply. Um, when that happens, there's an indicator, it's located over here, uh, that shows us the locked and unlocked configuration for that particular bolt. Um, so. Uh, the troubleshooting that Ed mentioned, uh, we tried this several times. Our last attempt, it became bound, and we just, uh, at that point, decided the best approach was to leave it where it is, do additional troubleshooting on the ground, and come up with a workaround plan um, that Mr. Suffredini mentioned and uh, we'll put in place and try here in the near future or determine if there's a, a better course of action. So that's all I have. Okay, with that, uh, we'll start our questions. We'll start here in Houston. Mark? Uh, thanks. I'm Mark Rowe for Aviation Week. Um, I have a couple questions, and I just want to be clear on how the box is now fastened to the station. And if I understand it right, one bolt is holding it to the station, and then it's lashed with a tether to the handrail. So it's secured that way? Is that? Well, the uh, we come up with a plan pre-EVA where uh, conditions like this, if they arise, we come up with a safe configuration that uh, restrains the bolt uh, with a, a tether. And what we have is a long duration tie down tether. It's designed specifically to hold the, uh, the box in place for long duration. Um, we have a tether point on the box itself and the tether point down on station. And we do this for all the boxes that we intend to, uh, to remove and replace. We come up with a, a method of doing this. Um, it just so happens that the bolt is now partially driven in, so that's additional restraint. Um, but it is not the, the correct configuration of that box. So could you talk about What's affected in a power sense when you're in, uh, when you have three main bus switching units? What some of the trade offs are that you might be working in the next day or so in terms of providing power and, you know, whether it influences communications or life support or research or just, you know, what you have to sort of sort through to, to take care of the priorities? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess to, just to provide the, the, the clarification. So we have power to the subsystems of the space station from six of our arrays, but all eight of the arrays are, of course, still operating and still fully functional. The two arrays that we're not pulling power from, there it's 1A and 1B are what we call them. They are still charging their own batteries, and there are systems out uh, associated with those solar arrays that still need maintenance, and those arrays are still providing the power to do that. Um, so just to clarify that, if there was a question there. With the subsystems inside and outside the vehicle that are not related to their own solar arrays, we are down to six power channels to provide all that power. And um, 
we have flight rules in place that give us a maximum loading of kilowatts per channel, and that's what we work to uh, balance across the channels that we have available. The, uh, the space station, now that it's uh, fully assembled and operational, it actually has a lot of flexibility to route power around through different means. So we can be creative with how we uh, share, uh, we call it uh, share ratios, but uh, how we share power across the power channels to be able to provide as uh, uh, much balance as we can across them. But that said, there are some things that uh, do require more power and are, are only connected to certain power feeds. So for example, the, uh, the space station arm, the SSRMS, uh, when it's in use does draw power and so one of the things that we have the if we haven't done it already we'll be doing tonight before they go to bed is they will uh, disconnect the robotics workstation in the US lab so that uh, that piece is not drawing power off of uh, the power channels that are highly loaded so we take actions like that to um, turn off equipment that aren't uh, necessarily required uh, to make the most power available to, to put in other places. Uh, another tactic that we'll use is uh, we normally have shell heaters for all the different modules uh, on such that they can turn on themselves if needed, so they just run on their own thermostats. Uh, we might instead go to a manual shell heater operation to where we are selective on which shell heaters turn on so that they come on using the correct uh, power channel. But it's really on a bigger scale, um, we're just balancing the loads across the six channels that we have without um, minimizing or reducing our operational uh, redundancy we need to actually go fly the vehicle. You also mentioned payloads, and that is going to be something we're going to have to look at. Obviously, we want to keep doing that world-class science that we do. Um, we just have to be smart on which facilities we have up at a given time so we don't have two facilities that use a lot of power on the same feed. Further, Mark? Okay. We'll go to our phone bridge questions. Uh, we'll start with Marcia at the Associated Press. Yes, hi. Um, I'm wondering what's the earliest you think a spacewalk might be held? And I'm wondering if, if, if any of the three of you, would you characterize this as an urgent situation that needs to be remedied, or, or how would you talk about that? Okay, I'll do it. Uh, let's see. Um, there's an advantage to going outdoors uh, uh, here in the next little while while Joe Acaba is still on orbit for us because he's the arm operator and the, the, the team's uh, got all the experience they have now with having worked on the, on the MBSU. And so the urgency really is not about the configuration of the ISS or the, or the condition the MBSU is in. It really is, um, if we wait too long, we have to do retesting of the EMUs, we have to uh, do some uh, checks of, of the different systems that support the EVA. So if we can, if we can figure out a plan uh, that requires us to go EVA to go uh, solve this problem in the near future, uh, the advantage to us is saving crew time and getting ready to go outside in the crew's immediate experience having already dealt with this for some time. Uh, but from a system perspective, we're stable and in good shape. Uh, we actually, with this reconfiguration, we actually do even get some uh, redundancy back. Um, and so I would tell you, uh, this is not a, a, um, a configuration we want to stay in for a long period of time, but, but even in this configuration, we're, we're uh, robust to, uh, to many failures still. Uh, and so in, in that respect, we're not rushing out the door to try to hurry up and fix it. We're really trying to take advantage of our experience and the crew that's on board today. Um, also, with the flights coming up, um, uh, the HTV departure and then uh, ultimately with the Soyuz departure, um, these, of course, are critical operations. And so we'll have to look, if we want to try to do this sooner rather than later, then we'll have to look at those two operations. Um, the HTV from the standpoint of do we have to do it right now or can we maybe delay it a little bit till after Joe leaves um, in order to, to get that, uh, that work done. Now, we, we're, we're not entertaining uh, asking the crew to stay on orbit longer. Uh, and so using that as sort of a constraint, we're just trying to see if we can figure out a plan of attack, uh, if we can, can get it done before, for, before Joe departs and while the systems are still configured for the EVA to minimize the impact and crew time uh, to research. 
Thank you. And, and in, is what is your in your mind right now, subject to change, of course, what is the earliest you could expect to go out? Would it be Labor Day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday? Do you have any clue uh, as to when might be the earliest? I would. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, of course, we got to get the crew rested. Uh, and we got to figure out what we're going to do, and that's probably the biggest thing. We need to, you know, the teams have been working all day today to try to get this thing installed, and so now they're going to they're going to step back, and and uh, we'll have to go get the uh, qual unit of the um, of the heat exchanger, which has the post on that Keith showed you. Uh, we'll go get the qual unit for the MBSU. We'll take those out and probably building nine somewhere, and we'll we'll try to look at what our options are and what we can do. We'll have to look at. Uh, the build paper for the S0 to see if we had anything happen during the assembly that would help uh, help us understand what we're dealing with. We have to look at other techniques. So I would I would tell you, Marshall, the long pole in the tent really for us is going to be can we can we figure out things that we could uh, do to try to recover this. Uh, and and by the time we've done that, we've talked about it, we've generated procedures, we've. Um, you know, run through those procedures together and potted those procedures. I think that will be the driving force, uh, and and by that time the crew will be rested and we'll have a plan in place. So I I would think that uh, if if we can, we try to get out outdoors uh, early early next week if we can come up with a plan. Again, I think that's the biggest driver is knowing what we do, uh, and and. Um, having worked it enough to feel confident that we have, you know, plan A, plan B, plan C, and plan D potted so we can get out there and be productive uh, when we do finally go outside. Thank you very much. Okay, next we have Bill from CBS. <clears throat> yeah, hi, guys. Um, yeah, maybe this is for Keith or, or, uh, or Ed, I'm not sure. I'm a little bit confused. Is, is the box... Is the bolt jammed right now? In other words, is it jammed on the post, or can you get it off? That's my first question. I'm confused about it. Secondly, is can this device could it is it even possible to jumper this thing outside if it came down to that? If you could never get it to drive down on the post like you want it to, are there possible workarounds to uh, with cabling or whatever to to, to get around that? Well, to answer the uh, first part of your question, the, the bolt is uh, jammed right now. We, uh, I don't remember the exact turn count that we got on it, but we did uh, drive it with the torque multiplier that Keith uh, explained and drove it as far as we could before the, uh, the tool torqued out. Um, we did that, however, such that uh, we could still be able to get it back out if, if and when we need to. So we were very methodical in our approach so that we always had a, uh, a known setting that we could use to back it back out. So you saw us backing out several times today, and uh, the torque that we went into the, uh, the bolt the last time, uh, there's still a torque setting uh, with that torque multiplier that will allow us to get it back out. So it's not uh, jammed in there such that we can't go either direction. Uh, we did leave it uh, with it jammed in, uh, I'd say, probably four or five turns on the bolt and then uh, with a long duration tether that Keith mentioned. As far as jumpers uh, to go between the S0 truss and the MBSU, for example, we don't have anything like that right now. It doesn't mean that uh, creative people uh, on orbit and on the ground couldn't come up with solutions. So as of right now, we've only just begun to start uh, talking about what the different options might be. Of course, we want to really resolve the issue and get the box uh, fully installed. But uh, part of that, of course, will will spin off, I'm sure, discussions about, well, what happens if we just can't and what is our long-term solution going to be? And with the creativity that there is with uh, people around here and um, if we have the materials on board, there could very well be a possibility, but we haven't had uh, any of those discussions yet. Well, can you give us any idea of what sorts of things might be done to, to get this thing fixed? I realize you don't have an answer yet, but I'm, I'm confused, I guess, enough to have any idea what might be possible. Thanks. Well, let's see. Um, obviously, the, the go straight at it approach was tried today. We tried multiple torques of just driving it in, multiple torques of driving it out, uh, wiggle it this way, wiggle it that way, cant it uh, in different orientations. So those were all the, the easy, uh, maybe not so easy, but the, uh, the lowest hanging fruit uh, to attempt. So really, the first thing that has to happen is we have to, like Mr. Suffordini said, go back and look at the vehicle, um, go look at the design and see if there might be some... Uh, some tricks in there that we can use to uh, use the tools to just actuate that bolt. 
Um, Keith mentioned the connector cleaner tool. We, uh, I believe we have additional uh, capabilities with uh, similar tools like that to possibly clean out the, uh, the S0 side and the bolt side. So people will be looking at that. There's, uh, there's a lubricant. I'm sure you heard uh, the bolt threads and the receptacle threads were lubricated. Um, people, I'm sure, will be looking at that and see if there might be something we need to do in the ways of uh, lubrication um, to make things turn a little bit uh, more easily. Um, and that's just off the top of my head, uh, trying to come up with uh, things that people are going to look at. And I'm sure we'll go even deeper and further to come up with, uh, like you said, plans A through D. I will mention a couple of other for you, Bill. We, um, you, you have to keep in mind it's a blind mate connection. So when you talked about the jumper, when the MBSU comes down, uh, not only are the electrical connectors connecting, but the fins for the cooling system are, are, can, are interlacing with one another. And we have to have that interface in order to keep it cool. So uh, the idea of a jumper is very difficult because you got to get in there and try to get the jumpers between the blind mate connection and still get the box down, but you can't get the box down because the screw won't, won't screw down. So you, we really can't operate in a configuration where the MBSU, at least not at high loads, where the MBSU is not connected to this heat exchanger. So that's one of the, one of the issues. And so some of the things we've talked about while Ed was busy doing his, his day job back with the engineers we talked about was, is there a way to either remove the post itself or remove the screw from the MBSU in order to, to get it down and let just the other bolt, what we call the H1 bolt, hold the MBSU in place and, and maybe add a strap. Um, it turns out both of those are, are kind of difficult, um, uh, but the, the teams, that's, those are two other options the teams are off to look at. Uh, we'll look at whether or not we can go higher on torques if we change techniques like Ed mentioned. Uh, we also are considering whether the, um, the SPDM can be utilized and whether or not as a robot we can apply forces on it to, to help it go down. All of these things are being kicked around and I assume uh, starting tomorrow the teams will have a, a whole list of other things, as Ed said, uh, as possibilities that we'll sort through uh, to see if we can get this thing installed. Okay. Anything else, Bill? All right, then we'll go ahead and move on to uh, Elvira with the EFN News. All right, not hearing anything, uh, Todd, before today. Uh, thanks. Todd Halverson of uh, Florida Today. For anybody who wants to take it, I'm I'm wondering if uh, somebody can explain uh, in real layman's terms why you would not be able to, you know, drive a simple bolt, something that uh, everybody does in their garage. Um, I suspect it has to do with thermal uh, conditions in space, but uh, perhaps you could elaborate. Who wants to take it? Gosh, I guess if we knew that, we'd have it bolted down by now. Um, you know, it's, it can't be cross-threaded. It's an Acme bolt. It's a, it's a very big square-threaded bolt. Um, but bolt galling is a very um, common condition, uh, which you may or may not have experienced in your garage. Um, you know, most of us, us uh, shade tree mechanics, and I count myself as one of those, uh, I've, I've, I've uh, cross-threaded a bolt or two in my life and galled a bolt or two in my life. And... Um, you know, when you do that, it's your, it's your car, and you're only marginally worried about your success, and so you just get a bigger torque wrench out, and you hope you can get it down. Um, but, you know, really, as an ops team, we can't do that. So we have to worry about you can – there are conditions where you can gall bolts and then not be able to move them. And in this case, if we had, if we had done that with this particular box and gotten it half on, uh, we'd be in a really bad – spot. So part of it is we don't just get the biggest torque wrench out and try to, you know, really kind of lean on this thing until it starts to move or the, or the, the bolt shears off uh, because that puts you in a much worse position. So it's a, you know, it's got to be a combination of 
of uh, some version of galling. Perhaps we assumed it was associated with how the box goes down. As we said earlier, you've got, as the box comes down, you've got one bolt driving first. In fact, we didn't start pulling down on the other bolt, which is a little shorter, the H1 bolt. The H2 bolt's got to get you down, and then you drive the H1 bolt. Well, while that's happening, you're, you're eventually going to come down and settle on the, on, the, on the fins, and there's a whole bunch of fins that, that uh, small fins that meet each other, and then you're going to have the connection over here. Well, in the process of doing that, you know, you're trying to make sure this box is coming down square, and so we, we assumed eventually, after we pulled the box off and confirmed that the bolts didn't look galled, and that's kind of a hard assessment to make outside, but, but it looked like it wasn't galled, and after cleaning it up, we thought maybe it was a technique thing, and so we started down this technique path of trying to get this, this, uh, this box settled down. So, so somewhere in there, you're either dealing with contamination, you're dealing with uh, you know, we're getting it a little cocked, and, and that's making it hard for us to drive the bolt. Maybe the bolt is galled. That's one of the things we'll have to talk about. Can we recover from? Uh, maybe is a thermal difference, and for some reason the bolt's a little bigger than the, than the socket, but we go to great pains to make sure that's not the case we, when we do tolerances before we fly. Um, but we'll look at all these different options to, to, to uh, see what's keeping us from getting this bolt down. And, uh, and, and see if we can find a path that will give us the, uh, the additional force or oomph we need to get this uh, installed without actually damaging ourselves, to the, damaging it to the point that we can't uh, ultimately remove it and get a, uh, a new one on. Again, as you recall, we pulled this off. When we pulled the old one off, we noticed the contamination, but we looked at the bolt on the, on the, on the failed unit that came off. The bolt was in good shape. We went and installed it in the FSC. And, and other than, you know, trying to get it positioned down there and torqued down, we, we, it went in okay. Uh, and so right now we're not assuming that we're dealing with a completely um, a damaged socket or, or that we're not dealing with a bolt issue on the spare. Uh, otherwise, we could, just, we could go get the other spare and install it. But that would be one of the things we'll talk about is whether or not we think maybe we did something uh, to the spare in the process of trying to get it installed. So all those things we're going to have to talk about. Uh, to, to see where we think we are and what the what the path through the wilderness will be. Thanks, Mike. Okay, on to uh, Pat with the German Press Agency. All right, uh, Denise, space.com. Hi, thanks. Um, I think this question is for Ed. Um, I'm just wondering if um, you're still thinking or if early assessments um, lead you to believe that there might be some debris still stuck in, in the bolt housing, and if so, was that likely caused when the bolts from the faulty unit before were being removed? Well, as Keith mentioned, we did two different methods of uh, trying to get FOD out of the S0 receptacle. The uh, first thing that we did uh, when we pulled the uh, MBSU out for the first time, we had uh, Sunny Williams go look at it, and she did tell us about the little bit of fog that she could see. And uh, based on that, we went and got uh, the needle nose pliers out of the crew lock and had her uh, put that into the receptacle to try to get the debris out of uh, out of the area. We attempted installing the MBSU, as you know, and didn't have luck, so we got the uh, connector cleaner tool. And with that, we shot uh, a couple puffs of nitrogen in there, and um, she reported that she did see uh, more debris coming out. And after that was complete, she looked in, and as far as she could see, there was nothing left uh, inside the receptacle. So we're fairly confident, for at least the best that we could see, that there was uh, no debris uh, remaining inside the uh, receptacle when we went to install it this last time. Now, it doesn't mean that there, of course, isn't debris generated now based on the efforts that we undertook and ultimately torquing out the, uh, the bolt, but when we went to install it the last time, uh, at least as far as we could, could see in the best of our ability, we were uh, clear of FOD, and we also inspected the bolt and uh, gave it a couple of puffs of nitrogen as well to uh, get anything uh, off of the bolt that we could uh, liberate. Thanks. And as far as I know, um, there, it wasn't possible or, or pictures just weren't taken of the work site. Um, does that pose a challenge, not being able to directly see the, uh, what's going on, or is, does it not really matter because you have the building plans for all of these components anyway? 
Well, we did actually have uh, the helmet cameras from uh, both Sunny and Aki, so we were able to get uh, pretty good views. But of course, the, the resolution that we would need to actually be able to see inside the bolt is something that uh, we just don't have on those cameras. We did have the crew take uh, still pictures, however. We, um, the very first time that we got the uh, failed MBSU out, we had Sunny take some still pictures so we know what um, the, the situation looked like before we attempted any cleaning and before we attempted installing the, the spare MBSU. And then also, as we were leaving the work site, uh, we had Aki use his camera to take some more pictures of the work site. And of course, that's with the MBSU uh, installed as we have it right now. But at least we have uh, good, clear indications of what the work site looks like. We were also getting great verbal cues from the crew. They were telling us the separation distances between the hardware and the truss, for example. They were telling us what the status indicators were doing that Keith mentioned. Um, so based on their verbal cues, uh, we were also, uh, I feel confidently well aware of uh, what was going on with uh, the situation in the work site. Great, thank you. Okay, and I think our last caller is Irene Klotz. Thanks, Kelly. Um, I have a few different questions. Uh, first of all, could someone just describe the uh, dimensions of this bolt and also just, I'm having trouble getting my head around this, neither the H1 or the H2 bolts are currently engaged, is that correct? Well, um, as we mentioned, the, uh, the H2 bolt is the first bolt that we drive when we're putting the box in, and so all the troubleshooting that we did back and forth um, allowed us to get at least a few turns into the H2 bolt. So that is driven um, probably on the order of uh, four or five turns. Um, the dimensions, the box itself is probably, um, you know, I would say on the order of a um, probably about, I don't know, 60 centimeters by about 40 centimeters by about maybe, I don't know, a foot deep. I'm changing you know, units here in the middle of this thing. But uh, the bolt itself is a, is a pretty good sized bolt. Um, I can't really, it's hard to show in, the, in what I have here, but um, it's, a, it's a pretty good gauge bolt. It's, it's sturdy, it's used to, for launch loads and, um, and, and holding the box in place uh, during that. And uh, then again, when it's on orbit, um, so uh, we could probably provide you with information on, on all of those dimensions but I don't have them here. Oh, um, okay, can you, you can't just like estimate the diameter of it, like the, there's something that you can, can you show think the, of as an analogy to have the, the diameter. Hole. I don't know oh. if somebody can zoom in on. No, show them the size of the hole on the, everybody yeah, that'll give you some sense of the size. Okay, well, to give you a gauge, this is, this is the bolt right here, and I'd say probably on the order of I don't know, half inch to three fourths of an inch, and it drives into this particular hole right here. Um, so, uh, if that gives you any indication, uh, the torque that one of the things that um, we prepare for when we're installing a bolt like this is, um, as Ed mentioned, we, we change the torque, um, stepping it up and increasing it each time we tried to drive uh, the bolt. There is a failure threshold that we uh, that we work towards, and so um, we want to make sure that we maintain a torque that will not shear the bolt off, and and that creates all kinds of other problems. And and so part of our troubleshooting and and what we want to do and, and maintain is is not actually causing irreparable damage, such as breaking a torque. So um, the torque value uh, that this particular bolt would shear at while driving it in is something on the order of uh, 63 foot pounds. Um, so we keep that in our scope as we're increasing the torque and using the tools to drive it. Um, we could well exceed that with the tools that we have, um, so we have to be very careful in, in how we approach uh, driving the bolt. Thanks. And um, how many um, how many of the how many spare uh, units are currently on the station? Um, and have you? I can't remember if this has ever been uh, replaced before. So I think we had, uh, so you're catching us all cold because we have so many spares on orbit now. Uh, I believe we had two MBSU spares on orbit. Uh, in fact, I, we were fixing to fly one here in a few flights. But we have, I believe we had two spares on orbit. So we were about to uh, 
we were about to consume this one, and uh, and so that would leave us with one more. And then I believe the next HTV flight was going to bring up uh, another spare MBSU as well. So we we do have plenty of spares. And then the last uh, question I had was about the um, science um, impacts, if any. I wasn't very clear about why um, uh, how um, how you're going why you'd lose. Uh, to use the power availability of two of the arrays um, with this unit not connected. And um, if you uh, did power down anything, even you know today or yesterday, in preparation for the replacement of this unit, and in particular, I'm interested in um, AMS and any other of the kind of very high-profile experiments. Thanks. Well, as far as uh, the power downs are concerned, uh, of course, the MBSU itself, each we have four MBSUs operating on the vehicle, and each of them takes the input from two power channels, and just, so you've got two inputs, and distributes them across uh, multiple different output feeds. And we route that to uh, all, all over the uh, truss segments, then to all of the laboratories, and we send some of that power back to the Russian segment as well. And so that's, that's what the uh, critical function is that these MBSUs provide. So when you take away a quarter of uh, the capability, and that specifically is the uh, 1A and 1B power channel feeds, we have to uh, make do with only the six remaining power feeds coming out of the other MBSUs. And that have, uh, of course, everything on board the vehicle uses power, so we have to do a, a balancing act with that power. And our, our research facilities use power just like everything else. And uh, again, it's uh, at this point, uh, getting ready for the EVA, we uh, went and made a specific power down plan so that we could keep all of our uh, necessary redundancies with these jumpers installed. We could um, keep the heaters off that we didn't need to be running and uh, basically make sure that we were in a, a good uh, power posture for this day. Now we just need to continue that uh, through the next uh, several days until we get this issue resolved. And we have a great team, a power resource team, and that is their primary function and they are exceptional at it uh, to looking at all the different resources that are required. And so what will happen is uh, for any given day, the uh, all the users of power, so you've got your core systems that uh, need just a given set of power. You have uh, your core uh, research facilities that are always on, for example, AMS. Uh, being one of those, and then you have the periodic loads, uh, be they the uh, space station robot arm or a specific payload facility that needs power at a specific time or for a specific day. All of those will go into the power resource uh, officers and uh, they will uh, lay it out onto the maps of uh, what's predicted to uh, be our capability for that given day. And ideally, we'd like to accommodate everything, and sometimes that doesn't work. And now that we only have six of eight power channels, uh, we have to be uh, a little bit more uh, constrained in what we can manage. And what that might mean is that if a particular payload wants to do science on Wednesday um, with some other activities also occurring on Wednesday, they may have to uh, accept doing it on Thursday instead just so we can keep the power balanced. So as far as capability for doing research, the ongoing research will keep going, and it's just the periodic research that uh, we pick and choose to do on certain days will be uh, a little bit more constrained on uh, potentially, just uh, given on what our capabilities are for that day, uh, whether or not they'll be able to operate. But um, we're not looking at needing to shut down any of our uh, key research facilities, um, not the AMS uh, or any of the others and we will uh, be able to continue uh, doing all the research. It's just a matter of being able to schedule it. Thanks very much. Okay, we skipped over a couple of folks that were on the phone. I want to make sure none of them rejoined us. Okay, and any follow-ups here at JSC, Mark? Yeah, thanks, Mark Caro uh, from Aviation Week, and I think these are pretty quick questions. I just want to make sure, though, that I understand the four MBSUs were uh, fitted onto the truss before it was launched, so SCO came up. And uh, from your demonstrations, the, the bolts are integrated into the, the truss and the MBSU. It's not like you can go get a spare bolt somewhere. You really have to work with what you've got. Is that the sense of it? All right. 
Well, with that, uh, I want to thank everyone for being here for today's briefing. Uh, here at the Johnson Space Center, the newsroom will continue to track the progress of the team as they uh, work on the issues that occurred today. And we'll be providing all the updates on the Internet at uh, the NASA website at www.nasa.gov station. Uh, with that, we'll close the briefing. Thank you for coming.